to part 7 of what is a church. To give you a quick summary, what we're doing is this is a series where I'm going through the book of Acts and maybe later the rest of the New Testament and I'm going to try to put together what the Bible says a church is. I've started in Acts because um, very often people want to say they are a book of Acts church and so that's why I thought that's a good place to start to see what does it really say. I'm trying to do this also without my own preconceptions or ideas of what a church is. I want to see purely what the Bible says. I will use some historical context to try and um, frame where and what they're doing. And that's the idea of this series. Uh, if you're interested in what's going on and you wonder where I come up with some ideas that I might have in this talk, uh, remember this is part seven. I've been through other things in uh, the scriptures already and they've already started to form a basis and we're just building on that. This week I read through Acts 10, 11 and 12. And I will quickly give a quick overview of what's happening. Uh, go through a couple of interesting points. And I'll give you a summary of what I think a church is uh, at this point in my study. So in Acts 10, we uh, start reading about Cornelius, who is a centurion. He's a Gentile, but he's a God-fearing man. And so he uh, wants to know more. An angel appears to him, asks him to go get Peter. Peter's just at this point having a vision. And he's called... Uh, out of the vision, um, pretty much God says in the vision, you know, eat these animals. Peter says, I've never eaten anything unclean, and God says, don't call unclean what I call clean. So Peter goes with Cornelius uh, because of this vision, because he has a Gentile. Jews don't mix with Gentiles. God's saying it's okay. So he goes with. And the amazing thing is the Holy Spirit falls on these people while Peter is there. And so Peter says, let's baptize these people. He then goes to Jerusalem and has to report what he did, because there are people from what they call the party of the circumcision, um, who are upset because how can you go to a Gentile who is not circumcised? And so Peter goes and explains to them what happened. In the meantime, in Antioch, the same thing is happening. There are Gentiles coming to the faith, uh, becoming believers. So um, while Peter is defending himself in Jerusalem, they send Barnabas there. Barnabas sees this is happening. He's quite um, happy to see what's happening. So he goes and fetches Saul, who we last saw uh, in Acts 8 or 9. Um, he goes and fetches Saul from out of Tarsus, and the two of them start working with people in Antioch. Uh, the two of them go back to Jerusalem briefly uh, because of a famine. They bring some aid from Antioch. And uh, while in Jerusalem, uh, Herod starts uh, persecuting the Christians, and he kills James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John, who wrote the Gospel of John. Peter is arrested with the idea of also having Peter killed. But Peter escapes when an angel comes to set him free. He goes to the house of Mary. The mother of Jean Mark, that's the Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark. We then also see that Peter um, travels and uh, starts going elsewhere. In the meantime, Barnabas and Saul go back to Antioch, um, and that's where chapter 12 ends. Now, there's some very interesting things to note that have uh, been read in this bit, and we'll go through some interesting points. Firstly, Cornelius is a Gentile. Another idea is the Jews and the Gentiles did not mix. That was not allowed to be a Jewish custom. But uh, Peter goes there because of the vision he had and Cornelius gets saved. And the interesting, interesting thing to notice is the Holy Spirit comes upon these people, upon the Gentiles. And then Peter says, what's stopping them from being baptized? Now, for the Holy Spirit to be poured on these people, or for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or the filling of the Holy Spirit, or however you want to refer to it to happen, they have to be believers which means they're believers and then they're baptized in obedience. We've mentioned this many times before, and it's something I try to reiterate is if you are saved, you can be baptized. You do not get baptized to be saved. Um, baptism follows your salvation. You're choosing to align yourself to Jesus, choosing to be um, a disciple of Jesus. Something else that I think is interesting, and I'll elaborate on this a little bit further, but when Peter goes to Caesarea, he goes with a group of people. We also see when Barnabas is going to work in Antioch, he goes to fetch Saul. And I'm going to come, uh, when I do my summary of what is a church, uh, go into this deeper because I do believe that when you are out there working with new people and spreading the gospel, you do not do it alone. Also, uh, something interesting, Peter goes to Jerusalem to defend why he went and spoke to Gentiles. Which is an interesting thing because why would he have to do that? He was following the Spirit. Um, but the idea here, I think, is there is some form of leadership in Jerusalem and he had to go and give account of what he was doing. He's being held accountable for his actions. Uh, we see later on also there is a reference made to the elders in Jerusalem. So there seems to be some form of leadership. 
Exactly what that entails is not clear now, but hopefully we'll get more information as we read further as to who these people are. We also see a reference made to the church, as in the church in Jerusalem. And also, there's a mention of Barnabas and Saul being with the church, and the context is this is a church in Antioch. Now, the idea why this is important is because of uh, when people talk about what is a church, I've been trying to find this out. Very often we've been approaching the church as the church of Jesus Christ, as in all the believers of the whole world. But we also see the term church can be used for a group of believers in a set location. And this is very important to take note of because uh, some people don't want to accept that as a definition, but the Bible clearly does use it. We also see that there are prophets. Uh, Agabus is mentioned as a prophet. He goes down to Antioch. He starts prophesying of a coming famine. And um, also interesting is to note that what Antioch does is because the famine is going to hit Jerusalem, they put relief together. Now, whatever that is, I don't know. Was it funds? Was it that they gathered some foods? We don't know, but they sent Saul and Barnabas back to Jerusalem with those, with that relief to help. And the interesting thing is also that Barnabas and Saul gave the relief to the elders and so that it could be spread to the community in Jerusalem. Talking about the elders, um, we are led by the Spirit. We see also very often a lot of things happening. You know, Philip goes places being led by the Spirit. Paul gets a vision from the Spirit and knows he has to go to Cornelius. We see this happen a lot. But we also see examples where, for instance, Barnabas is sent to Antioch to see what's happening. So there's also um, a non-spirit leading as well. So we are led by the spirit, but we do see a reference made to the elders in Jerusalem. So I do want to get more information on those. I hope we get to see more of them uh, as we read through Acts. But it is important to note that while we are, yes, led by the spirit, there is some form of accountability as with why Peter had to defend himself in Jerusalem as to why he was talking to Gentiles. So I do think that we've got to understand there are two, and in what way does one follow people? Um, look, we're not there to please people. We're there to please God. So when the Spirit leads us, we have to do what the Spirit says. Uh, it's something that also was made very clear when the Pharisees were telling them not to preach Jesus, that they said, we can't go disobey God. So we do obey the Spirit first, but there does seem to be some form of accountability, and I do want to see how that works out and who these elders in Jerusalem are. And one last point which I do want to mention, uh, because this is something we've got to keep in mind, um, it's called textual criticism. It is the study of ancient texts, comparing them, finding differences, and trying to see do they make sense or are they contradictory of what's going on. And in Acts 12 we have an example of this, where it says, um, we read in the text in Acts 12 that it says, uh, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, but there are manuscripts that say that they returned to Jerusalem. Now, how does this work? Are they contradictory or what's going on? I think because it's, uh, from what I've gathered, there are two manuscripts that say two. Some one make like it's half or whatever, but it's very much the minority. It can be a copying error. But when you do read this text, you can see from the context that it is they turned from. Because, remember, they're working in Antioch. They bring relief to Jerusalem. It then says they returned from Jerusalem. And when we start Acts 13, we will see, I checked this up just to try and get an idea of the context, they are in Antioch at that point in time. So it is very clear to see that, uh, in this case, it is from Jerusalem. And that's textual criticism. is just studying, looking, and reconciling, working at what's really being said. So, let's summarize. What is the church, or a church? The church, number one, is simply the believers in Jesus Christ. We refer to it as the church of Jesus Christ. It's all the believers in the whole world. Those are the people who have dedicated themselves to Jesus, aligned themselves with the will of Jesus, believing in Jesus as the Savior, as the one who died and rose from the grave, as the Son of God and as God. Those are the believers, that is the church. We also see that a church can be a group of those said believers who worship together in a certain location. So the church can be used for both of those terms. What do we know about the believers? What do they do? Well, one thing is they get baptized as soon as possible, and they do get filled with Holy Spirit. Those are things that we see happening very quickly. Um, there is no uh, long wait and course that needs to be followed. Do it quickly. We also see that they pray. We see uh, them praying as a group. For instance, when Peter arrives at uh, jean Marc's mom's home, they were praying. But we also know they pray individually, which is what Peter was doing when he got the vision of the animals before he went to visit Cornelius. We also know that they praise God and they study the scriptures. And we know that they met together regularly. And uh, in Jerusalem they would do that at the temple. 
and we see the meeting often. We also know that it says they did also meet in houses, so that's a more intimate group. And we also see that in Antioch, when Barnabas and Saul start working, they met with the church, it says. So they met with the believers in Antioch as well as a group. So it is normal for believers to get together in that way. Also, what we've been seeing is that these believers become disciples and they start doing the things that they are taught by the apostles and start doing the same things. And so that is including uh, healing people, preaching, filling people with the Holy Spirit, baptizing people, all those things the disciples are doing as well. Something else we see is also it says they have, were in fellowship together, and that means generally that's a term for um, eating together or breaking bread. As it says, they do that uh, as a community, but also in separate houses. We also know that a fellowship has got to do with them sharing all things in common. This was originally done because there were a lot of believers in Jerusalem, but as they scattered, they were apparently doing it in their different areas. And we do see, for instance, Antioch even gathering a relief to send to Jerusalem. So there is a sharing, there is looking, and we see this very often that um, those in need are taken care of. It'd be that the widows were being taken care of and then when the Greek widows thought they were being treated worse, then people were, were assigned in a role to make sure that they were cared for properly. We saw someone like um, Dorcas making clothes for the widows and we see Antioch sending relief to Jerusalem. So when there is a need within the Christian community, we help and we support each other. If we are, can do it as possible, the Bible does make it clear that people do it uh, within their means, within their ability to do so. Then we come to the positions in the church. Now we've seen apostles and we know that the special criteria for apostle is that they've been with Christ from the baptism of John till his resurrection. So there are no new apostles today. Uh, someone did want to make a point of uh, apostle succession. There is no such thing as an apostle succession. To be an apostle you have to fit a certain criteria. If you do not fit it you cannot be an apostle. What we see in the succession is more a matter of disciples doing what the apostles did. So it's not like a special position that only they could do. It was a special position because they were with Jesus. They teach others to do the same thing. And so that's why we still can pray for the sick and see healing, preaching. We um, fill people with the Holy Spirit. is because as disciples we learn from those above us. We also see ministers. And those are literally servers. People taking care of the widows. In the case of the seven. And we see that, their, that the criteria for that is that they have to be men of good repute. Or have a very good name. They have to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and they have to be men of wisdom. Uh, if you do not fit that criteria, you cannot be a server. Now it says men, because in this case they chose seven men. I believe this is for men and women, because we see disciples. Those are the believers who started doing and learning from those who uh, are above them. You know, like the apostles teaching the next generation after them. And we see that those are men and women. Dorcas was called an apostle, so we know women are involved in this. We also know that they did meet together as men and women. We also see evangelists. Those are the people traveling around, like Philip. Uh, Saul and pa Barnabas start doing that. Peter also played the role of evangelist for a while. And those are the people traveling around from place to place. And we see elders who we still have to work out exactly who they are and what they do. But we have now seen a reference to them. And I had this unofficial uh, position of like a leader or spokesman from Peter. No longer is that position there because Peter is no longer doing that. Remember in the beginning we spoke about in parts 1, 2 and 3 I think mostly. About Peter always answering the questions and doing the talking. Peter has now been travelling and being more of an evangelist than a spokesman. So that position I'm going to be taking out. I will not reference it again in future editions. Something else. There are three things I do not think a church should be doing. And I'm going to point them out now. They might be controversial. It's fine if you don't agree with me. Uh, you may let me know. But you've got to understand that I'm basing this on what I'm reading out of God's Word at the moment. I may change my mind later. But at the moment, I don't think you should do these. Number one are these healing crusades where we go and advertise healing. It's the same as the prosperity preaching. You know, it's all about giving people blessings and healing and riches or whatever. That's not what the gospel's about. The gospel is about preaching Jesus Christ. If you see someone who's sick, heal them. Do not go in the idea with that we are going to heal people and use it as a sales point for Christianity. I do not believe you should do that. Whenever we read in the Bible about healing, we always see it is done out of compassion. It is done with preaching, um, but as a side to preaching. And one thing Jesus makes very clear when he sends us out, uh, and he says signs and wonders will follow, it's because they will establish the preaching. It is not about the signs and wonders. Second thing we should not be doing is what's called in and out evangelism. It is going somewhere into a city or a neighborhood, doing some evangelism and going away. 
uh, very often what we see is when the people are out there, they go into places and they start working. It actually says that um, Barnabas and Saul had spent a year in Antioch before they took relief funds to Jerusalem. That is a year they're working with the new believers. And we see that Peter, um, when you look at the historical context, had spent three years in Joppa before he went to go and visit Cornelius. So there is the idea of you take time to teach people properly. It's not in and out. Now, I'm not saying if you're invited to go somewhere and to help others uh, with evangelism, I'm not saying that's wrong. But to me, it's more a matter of these organizations who go in, plan this great event for a weekend and then disappear. Uh, you've got to have a presence there or you've got to leave a presence there. Um, otherwise, I mean, who's going to catch up, catch the new believers? They, someone's got to take time to teach them and make disciples. The third thing I don't support is uh, single people going out. Now, what I mean by that is Philip did travel alone, but he's the only example in the Bible we ever see of traveling alone. Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. So we always send them out in twos. And we see when they're traveling, we saw that, um, for instance, Barnabas went to Antioch. And so what did he do when he was there? He saw the believers, he was excited, he went and fetched Saul, and then Barnabas and Saul together started working with the believers. We know when Peter went to visit uh, Cornelius, he says he went with some of the brothers of Joppa. So it's very clear that as Christians, when we are going to go work somewhere, we work a, as a group and a team. And part of that has got to do with, if you let one man go and run the show, he can derail um, go wrong, make mistakes, and at least with the group, if someone makes a mistake, others can say, no, no, this is the way it is, oh yes, that's right, and we can fix it up, and also it's going to be very hard um, to corrupt the movement if you have other people checking up on you, or you've got to take your whole team and be willing to go corrupt, but then there's a huge other problem, and um, perhaps at some point that we can talk about that, but for now, the important thing to note is not single pe person, just one man going out, a team work in teams. Uh, it helps keep yourself uh, not only on the straight and narrow, it also helps you keep motivated. You can motivate the others and everybody can work well together. Anyway, that's all I have for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Please hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't and follow me on social media as well and um, wish you all a good week. Keep well and God bless. There's a train outside, I think. <laughs>